Jeff Foran, and this is your place to explore the weird, the strange and unexplained, from cryptids and creatures, the paranormal, aliens and UFOs, forbidden knowledge, ancient mysteries, conspiracies, and more. Hey everyone, welcome back to the show, and thanks for joining me today. I hope everyone is doing well wherever you are out there in the world. Summer is in full swing here, and now that we've passed the summer solstice, It seems like the heat switch has gotten turned on to full blast, so I am definitely thankful to have an air conditioner in my attic studio on hot days like this. As I'm recording this too, we have an air quality alert and can see some of the smoke coming down from Canada from the fires that have been going on out there for the past couple of weeks. Hopefully that situation gets resolved soon. Like you can literally smell and taste the smoke and it's kind of crazy. I'm not sure if anyone out there saw any of the satellite imagery back when they all started where they were all just popping up at the same time. Definitely a really interesting phenomena for sure. And just a heads up for the foreseeable future, the show is going to be going to a largely interview based format where I'll bring on a guest to the show And we're just going to chat about what they've researched, books they've written, and all manner of high strangeness and Fordian phenomenon. I've had a number of people reaching out to me wanting to come onto the show. I've been working with some people who represent a large number of different authors and researchers out there. And I made sure to pick some ones to come on for this initial round that I think you'll be really interested to learn about, hear about what they have to say with all of their research and different topics that they cover. And I have so many lined up that the show is maybe going to be going to a weekly release schedule for at least a few months, which is great. That's kind of, I've been wanting to get to that point and doing the research episodes is super fun, but with my limited schedule, it's hard to keep to anything less than a, a bi-weekly, <laughs> if, if I can even muster that uh, schedule. So hopefully I'll be able to keep up with all the editing and everything like that. I do plan on getting back into research episodes as well, as there's a lot of topics out there that I've had on the back burner that I want to cover. I also might turn those into videos for my YouTube channel or something like that. So stay tuned. There's a lot of stuff coming and it's going to be a lot of fun this summer and going into the fall as well. And before I get started with the episode today, if you're looking to support the show, you can head on over to patreon.com forward slash strangeology. Members get different perks like shout outs, ad free episodes, early access to episodes, along with access to the members-only part of the show, Strangeology Beyond, which is basically an episode extension, but sometimes these turn into whole episodes by themselves. There's also merch discounts, exclusive merch, and a lot more. So again, if you want to go check that out, learn about all the different tiers, and become a member, you can go to patreon.com forward slash strangeology. And one final thing here, just a quick reminder, if you are in upstate New York, Hudson Valley area, and New England as well, I'll be vending at the Sasquatch Culling Festival in Whitehall, New York on Saturday, September 30th in Skeensboro Park. It's outdoors, rain or shine, right next to a river. It's this big kind of craft, cryptid, Bigfoot-themed festival that goes on all day. It's going to be an awesome time. There's a contest at the end of the event where people go down to the little amphitheater that they have on the river and they do their best Bigfoot calls. (laughs) So it's a lot of fun. And if you're planning on going, 
come find my tent and uh, say hello. All right, that's enough of that. Why don't we get into today's interview? My guest for today is author and researcher Mark Fiorentino, and he's going to fill us in on how the universe really works, along with his ideas on UFOs, faster than light travel, stargates, and a whole host of fascinating topics. So grab a drink, grab a snack, sit back, and enjoy. Let's go. All right, folks, welcome back to the show. Today's guest is author and researcher Mark Fiorentino. Mark Fiorentino is a self-taught metaphysician who worked in the field of high-tech industry. He's worked as an electronic technician at Harris Government Systems, working on a killer satellite missile guidance system, and then spent time working as a computer programmer for IBM. Mark grew up in New Jersey, not far from Albert Einstein's hometown. And at the age of 10, Mark became fascinated by Einstein's theories, especially his unified field theory. And now, after five decades of his own research, Mark has completed this theory, but it's also opened the door to new theories and questions. In 2020, Mark published his book, Master of Reality, which highlights his research into understanding the fundamental nature of how the universe really works. So we're going to be going into a whole range of topics today about Einstein, Mark's own theory of super relativity, along with conspiracies about alien technology, UFOs, UAPs, and I'm I'm sure a bunch more. So welcome to the show, Mark. I'm so glad you're here. Uh, How are you doing today? Fine. Thank you, Jeffrey. It's good to be here. Great. Great. Uh, Can you talk a little bit about your professional background uh, with being a, a technician and, and being in the high-tech industry. What was that like? I, I enjoyed it. for the, I, I had a love of electronics since a little kid. And initially, I didn't go into that field. I went into media technology, which turned out to be a dead-end field for me. And uh, there really wasn't much there. Although the first job I had, I loved but uh, circumstances changed and i decided to go back to school get a technology degree in computers and electronics which i loved dearly graduated at the head of my class and uh went to work for high tech companies which was a lot of fun i i enjoyed electronics and computers and i've done it all my life uh, mainly you know, for a short time at Harris Government. I love that, but I wanted to get some more pay, so I went to IBM sure, and uh, got involved there, which I did a lot of not – programming really wasn't my main thing. I need to update that to, to what I really did was I was a troubleshooter. I worked in the quality engineering department, worked in uh, test engineering, worked in test uh areas um road programs and fabricated all kinds of equipment to automate testing so there's just a tremendous amount of technology stuff that i dove into and enjoyed and uh had a lot of fun uh, i miss it i still you know i'm retired now but i still dream about the days when i worked there and and so forth especially ibm that was a real great group of people that i worked with Great, great. Now you must have a mind that kind of wants to know how things how things work. Were you one of those exactly. uh, kids growing up that like to pull things apart to see <laughs> exactly what was going I on? That. I, yeah. I my toys. To, I ripped my father's watches, pocket watches. I really feel bad about that because I ruined some really expensive pocket watches. Oh no! <laughs> to see the guts in there, I wanted to see how it was working. So yeah, I, I was constantly modifying my toys to work better electric cars and so forth um that's how i played was tearing stuff apart and figuring out how it worked yeah yeah well that'll definitely lead you down that path um Mm -hmm. so you you grew up in a town right near where einstein lived and can you expand upon how you became fascinated with his theories about you know how our our world works and and that kind of thing 
Yeah, it, it started out up till the age, age of 10. I lived in Middlesex, New Jersey, which is right down the road from Princeton, maybe 20 miles or so. And um, Einstein and I just passed in the in, in the night, so to speak. Uh, he uh, actually died about 35 days after I was born. Oh, wow. So I was born in a hospital just down the road from Princeton University. And my parents did take me to Princeton when I was very young, eight or nine, somewhere in there. But I hadn't known all those years. I was scoring really high on the test at school. And the teachers were saying, you should, you know, get him interested in, you know, colleges now. And they were taking me to all the Ivy League schools. I was wondering why they were doing that. I, I enjoyed the field trips and everything, but um, yeah. So eventually, uh, when I was going to church and catechism, the nuns asked me and all the other students to find a saint born on our birthday. And so, at that time in '65, there was no internet, so you could ask your parents, uh, look in the encyclopedia, which was really hard to do a search for a date. Uh, or go to the calendar. And I went to the calendar and I saw on my birthday was Albert Einstein. So I opened up the books, the encyclopedia and started reading about him and was fascinated by the stories, by the interest, and especially the unified field theory, which I thought was the greatest idea I've ever heard. It, it just made sense to me immediately, even as a 10 year old. And after that, everything I read and thought about, even especially UFOs, I thought, if it has anything, anti-gravity must have something to do with the unified field theory, because it's part of the overall physics of the universe. And, and this gap, this lack of knowledge in that area was something I focused on to help make sense. I mean, I was already convinced by my teen years that anti-gravity existed and that we needed to, to learn about the actual cause of gravity, which is what I wrote about in my research paper and in my book. So that's how I got to Einstein, basically, was through discovering he, he and I were born on the same day and then embracing uh, all of that story, of course, watching documentaries about him and reading books about him and so forth. So it's been a long journey and i've enjoyed every bit of it yeah yeah that's a very interesting kind of synchronicity that you share a birth date with with einstein that's that's uh pretty cool <laughs> uh so the unified field theory is kind of like um the foundation for where you've built your own theories and for for your book can you give a brief overview of what unified theory uh, field theory is um, for my listeners out there who might not be as familiar with yeah. with science it's, and all that stuff. <laughs> it's surprisingly simple and sensible. If you you know get the right wording, it could be done in one sentence. Basically, electromagnetism and gravity emerge as aspects of a single fundamental field. So let me fan that out a little bit. What, what I did in my theory, electromagnetism is really a mix of two fields, an electrostatic field, which is basically was determined to be a twist of space, uh, the particles themselves, like electrons, uh, are geometries within the fundamental field, which at the time, 19, early 1800s, 1900s, early 20th century, was the ether. It's a basic fundamental field being that which is something made of something. And that something was described uh, in the final episode of the ether as being a quasi elastic solid. So that field is the stuff of which electrostatic fields are and magnetic fields, which are rotations. Uh, the particles like electrons, since they're twists in space, they're moving like that. Space rotates in reaction because it's all one. The particle and space are one in the same thing. Particles are just geometries in that fundamental field. And so they bend it. And that's what gravity is. It's 
specific type of bending or contraction. So that's all really the, the whole story is. What I did was break down the two fields, electrostatic and magnetic, separated them again, and said these two types of bendings cause uh, are different forces. And the final force, gravity, is the third type of bending, which is a contraction. And then I found the link in time that describes the physical cause of the contraction of space from the motion of electromagnetic particles. Interesting. That that makes me think of um, you know a couple of years ago there were some observations in, in deep space of gravitational waves that were that were detected. Did this kind of confirm your you know your workings into this? Yes. Uh, and I, I, you know, went to LIGO and was looking at their data. I suspect that within their data is more evidence that they have ignored ah. because they, they don't use the right model. See, yeah. they're thinking of gravity as being caused by a, a field, a, a specific field made of particles, gravitons, or something of that nature. And so it's a particle field. And, and in my theory, and in Einstein's theory, up to a certain extent, the geometry of space was a real physical bending and deformation of a continuous material. That's what a solid means. Yes. Which is continuous. There are no parts to it. That's the fundamental field. That's what forces are, different bendings of that field. And they, that those bendings like magnetic field, electric they cause force action at a distance so that drives the whole system in a sensible mechanical model but ligo you know in the quantum mechanics theory which is taking us away from a sensible model of reality um they they are betting on something they've never proven to exist which is the graviton my theory doesn't need graviton. Einstein's theory doesn't need gravitons. And that's why they can't find them because, well, they don't really exist. And, you know, they're going to have to bend over backwards to prove that they do exist. And when they do, it'll be a misinterpretation of some experiment they do because I'm quite certain they don't. But yes, what's really going through space is a wave like an ocean wave except there's no the ocean wave is made of liquid particles but this is a a, a wave that's like a bending and it moves through space uh, and expands out so that's the gravitational wave that i would expect and einstein would expect not one that's really based on a particle wave like water waves you know, the wave is made up of particles basically moving up and down in the wave. Um, it's a, it's a more of a transverse wave, I would, I would imagine the gravitational wave. And, uh, and it's the solid itself reacting to a collapse of a star or, you know, a black holes merging or something. And that space goes wrong. And then that ripple goes out forever basically interesting wow <laughs> well that's uh that certainly is pretty eye-opening for sure oh and one important thing why i was want, wanting to get the LIGO data or find out about how they make their measurements was because after that wave passes my theory predicts that the speed of light will be slower once that contraction happens because that wave it's not just a woo there's the addition and the increase in strength of the collapse of the two stars uh black holes or whatever increases the density in space which then will cause a slowing of the speed of light this is why we see a slowing of the speed of light in gravitational fields so every time there's a collapse and things become denser again there will be a slight slowing and they would notice that if they were looking but what i found out ligo does is they auto calibrate if the speed of light doesn't match the number they say they'll calibrate the system and move the mirrors back so they'll miss 
what I expect to see because they are assuming that the speed of light is always constant. It's not. Wow. So, that's super interesting. Does that get observed when you see like gravitational lensing, uh, like around distant galaxies out in the universe? Does the speed of light slow because of the, like the mass of like the whole galaxy? Is that what you're kind of saying? Uh, yeah. Whenever light goes into a gravitational field, um, Guaranteed, some observer outside who's watching that light will say, hey, it bent, and if I could time it, it slowed down a little. And that makes sense in my theory because, and I, and I really think they can measure that on Earth, because they can measure the difference in time, time flows is slowing down, which would be an indication that the clocks that are measuring time, which use atomic vibrations and such, they slow down. Everything is slowing down. So it's not really time that's slowing down. It's the, the objects or the the machines that we use to measure time. Uh, time intervals only appear as a result of uh, there being a medium that really exists. Distance equals rate over time. If distance isn't a real physical thing, you will not have uh, um, time emerge, time interval to emerge. There would be no time. Everything would happen instantaneously. A lot of phys a lot of physicists believe that space is made of nothing. Our particles are made of nothing, and everything is just consciousness or whatever. And uh, that's not really quite right. I see. I see. <laughs> There's more to the story than yes, there is God consciousness involved. But the God consciousness, through the power of intention, created this realm, everything in this realm. And, and so the space, the ether, the one and only thing that actually exists physically is the ether, the thing they don't think exists anymore since the year 1905 and the Michelson-Morley experiment, which failed to detect the ether wind. Interesting. I mean, I imagine, you know, the technology might not have been available <laughs> back then to really observe something like that. But um, well, the, the, that experiment was flawed. And I go into that in my book. I basically, you know, it took me years to figure out why they didn't detect the ether wind. It was a rock solid idea, except they failed to anticipate that the thing they were using to measure Alt never changes speed relative to other things like the speed of light is constant. Why? And the, they didn't know. And they still don't know. Uh, but I, I say it in my book. It's because light is self-moving. It is self-caused. So it then is separate from uh, everything else. Motion of the observer, motion of the receiver, <laughs> Uh, motion of the emitter. It doesn't matter because the speed of light is not like, you know, a pitcher throws a baseball. The speed of the baseball has to do with the external force applied by that person throwing the ball. That determines the speed of the ball. Not so with light. Inside of the light particles, a special type of uh, pressure wave, uh, along with a gravitational configuration that causes it to fall in that direction. And itself, and the only thing that determines it or affects it is the properties of space, the one and only thing, the medium in which it's going through. So they didn't realize that. And so their experiment was flawed because they anticipated that light speed would be affected by the motion of the Earth, the motion of the galaxies and all this stuff. So they thought they would be able to, you know, when it's going different directions at a right angle, one would be going with and against the wind and the other one would be parallel and they would see a difference, but they never did because the motion of the objects moving through the medium didn't affect the speed of light, which was independent of their motions. And he even says that, Einstein even said that in his paper, but doesn't really fully realize why that the why the particles because he didn't have an equation nobody to this day has an equation that describes the motion of particles they're self-caused and that's what 
the ex full existence of the universe. He who knows that has everything so far as unified field theory. And I'm working on that equation now. And oh, by the way, so was Einstein in his final days, July 20, 1925, unified field theory, gravitation and electricity. Final two sentences in his uh, paper says, nevertheless, I'm still far away from claiming the physical validity of the equations I derive. The reason for that is that I did not succeed in deriving equations of motion for particles yet. So he figured it out too. Wow. He's interesting. The only person I know that even attempted to figure that out. That is the core, the breath of no having that information is like the breath of God. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. This whole universe emerges because particles move, interact. Uh, you can detect, you can see. Without photons moving, the universe would go black. Without electromagnetic fields of chemistry, there would be no way to sense anything. Uh, it's all about, like Einstein said, nothing happens until something moves. Very interesting. So you've worked through decades of, of, of working with unified field theory, and you've come up with something you call super relativity. Can you s speak about that and how you arrived at that conclusion? Well, super relativity is really an extension of Einstein's work, not just Einstein's work, but Hendrik Antun Lorenz's work, Maxwell, James Clerk Maxwell's work, Faraday's work, and Newton. Those are my those are the shoulders I'm standing upon to, to wrap things up. Special and general relativity really just needed a little bit of a push and extension added to explain gravity, the actual cause, and which the theory of super relativity does, and anti-gravity, which no serious physicists have really given much attention to up until the last few years, but mainstream physics still is saying, oh, that doesn't exist. We don't believe, just like they say, UFOs, oh, they don't believe, we don't, oh, what? The United States Navy or Air Force got them on radar? What, you got eyewitness? What, you got infrared? Oh, well, I guess we'll have to change our minds and say, well, maybe there's something. Same thing with the belief in gravity and, <laughs> and anti-gravity they're clueless and so we're not going to get any real help from them but the, the, the theory of super relativity basically just proves einstein's statement electromagnetism and gravity emerge as aspects of a single fundamental field so i say the ether does exist in my book and in my theory it is the fundamental field and for in the forces magnetism and electrostatic and gravity are the three primary fields, with the electrostatic field being the, the ultimate primary field. Everything happens because of that one. Uh, the other two are emergent fields. Magnetism and gravity emerge as results of moving charge. And so that's what the theory of super relativity is, and that's what my papers are. If you go to my website, you click on the link to my papers. The first paper I wrote determined the speed of quarks inside of neutrons and protons. And he did, I needed that number to calculate the second paper to determine the actual central cause of gravity, which is nothing more than a mechanical distortion, a stress tensor, basically saying that let's around the neutron or a proton. I'll show you this. This is important. Something like this. Um, I discovered from a person who had a near-death experience, but I was looking for this, and I looked at near-death accounts to find this, the geometry. Oh, interesting. Oh, gosh, I can't get it to show up. Yeah, well. For those uh, for those who are, are are listening on podcasting versus watching this on YouTube, Mark is uh, showing a uh, a geometry of uh, inter an interweaving. It's kind of like a, almost like a Mobius strip, a little it's bit, a right? It's a trefoil knot. 
it's one of the most basic knots. It even shows up in religion a lot. Yes. Uh, but basically, I was looking for something made of three. I went and started reading near-death experiences to find somebody who engaged with God and saw a geometry that had three parts to it. That's all I knew. I was looking for a dynamical geometry, just like Einstein was looking for, but he didn't know that there was three quarks inside of the neutron and proton. So he didn't have a clue as to what was moving in the neutron and the proton that would cause gravity to occur. And it really comes, comes from basically the discovery that he made in special relativity, which is contraction of length, really more Fitzgerald and Lorenz discovered that particular phenomenon. <laughs> As an unbalanced charge moves in a circular manner or in a manner like that, uh, which is also rolling and spinning. So you get a, what you get because they're moving so fast, those quarks as a sphere that's precessing rapidly at 99.9% .9 the speed of light. And so those three quarks moving like that, generating this sphere causes a contraction around the perimeter, which is described clearly in air and best paradox. So if you're, you're wondering where I got the idea and where Einstein got the idea was from Paul Aaron Fest and I think Max Born before him that came up with that, that made people realize, hey, there is a geometric mechanical way to cause gravity. So in my theory, I'm saying that is the cause. There's no more mystery. It's not just some magic field where particles are bouncing off each other like quantum mechanics things. That way doesn't make sense. This way makes perfect sense and can be confirmed. And I put that in my equations and I demonstrated, I predicted the masses of neutrons and protons with a simple set of formulas that I pulled right from Newton and, and other places and solved the problem. And I said, so I can predict these because of nothing more than moving particles within space. And I did that. So that's the theory in a nutshell. It's basically backing up what Einstein said and following through. Yeah, that's that's very, very impressive and, and super interesting. Does that suggest that, you know, we, we'd be able to manipulate gravity? We could create it. Say you're on a space station and you need gravity so your bone density doesn't uh, <laughs> disappear when you're you're in 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 uh, microgravity environments or anti gravity to make you fly through you know different mediums. Yeah. Um, well, after that was over, I had to study anti gravity and, and come up with a way because if gravity is nothing more than a contraction of space, and you know. <laughs> This is, I'll tell you a funny story. It's absolutely true, and I have it on tape. <laughs> I have a recording of it. Uh, a while back, I went and talked to a medium about a problem, a health problem I had while I was writing the book. And once I got that resolved, because I've worked with mediums over the years, they actually predicted this date and time where I made this discovery and invention when I was 19 years old. And then five more mediums also backed up the first medium's claim. Well, here I am 50 years later from that prediction now is coming true. Well, I went to talk to this medium, Tamara Richardson, was her name, and about a very serious health problem I had, which I got was able to get cleared up that day. And as just a sidebar, I said, well, I got you here, and I, you convinced me you, you're really talking to the other side because my parents came through with some personal information. And, and I said, well, she's the real deal. She's good, and I have talked to the real deals before. And so I asked her about super relativity, my theory. I said, is there anything? I'm just writing a book and for fun, something to do when I retire. And, and she said, yeah, they're saying that you got it right. You've actually confirmed it. And then shortly after that, Albert Einstein comes through. And she said, man, this does not happen. You don't usually get celebrities come through unless they're involved or they have something to do with what you're doing or working on. 
And then he gave me some messages. And, and one of those messages, his first message that I knew was him, because while I was writing the book, as I was saying earlier, gravity is a contraction of space, right? Well, she's, and this lady's a country girl, knows nothing about physics, knows nothing about me, knows nothing about science. He says, why is Einstein going like this? And I got chills. This is answering the question I had for the last four years. And while I'm writing the book, and I'm thinking in my head, Albert, certainly somewhere you must have mentioned the word contraction and gravity in the same paragraph somewhere. And I had to search for that for years before I finally found it in the Ehrenfest paradox, which he was very excited about, which really basically pointed to contraction is the cause of gravity, the contraction of space. So she sent me that message and I got chilled and I said, yeah, I know exactly why he's telling me that. Because that's the question I had for the last four years while I was writing this book. So that, and there was a, a whole lot more. I won't get into a lot of the because they're really high strangeness. <laughs> <laughs> we can save so some I, of that for I later, maybe. <laughs> you know, I believe that I, she really did contact, it was actually Ray Bradbury and Albert Einstein. And uh, yeah, so there was all kinds of people coming through eventually during this reading. And uh, and a couple I had there after because uh, she had some advice to give the other side wanted to give me. And uh, so there's a definite connection between Albert Einstein, who I deeply admire and respect, and yeah. myself. Yeah, that must have been something to be, you know, sitting there having Einstein come through from the other side and he's kind of confirming some stuff for you. That's an experience once in a lifetime, seems like. It's a unique experience. I, I can, you know, I've come to realize that we all have a life plan. We all come to Earth. Everybody. I, I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're a street person or the Pope, everybody comes to Earth with a life plan, a mission, and it's up to us to remember what that mission was. And so on that day, I kind of got a little help in recalling what it is that I'm supposed to be doing. And that's why I'm going on these shows now to get the word out and yes. continue to do experiments in my lab, trying to uh, lock down anti-gravity and uh, energy generation, hopefully, as yeah. well. Uh, so there's work still to be done. And as long as there is, I'll be here bludging, you know, trudging forward. Yes, <laughs> it's a very important work for sure for it is. Uh, the, the benefit of all humanity, I would think. That's what I want to do. I want to leave something positive behind. And that would be the trick for sure. I yes. want to do my work. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to, um, to touch on the slip wave. Uh, can you describe what, uh, what that is for my listeners and, you know, how, how did you come across, uh, across it? Well, it starts from uh, just basically realizing again, that cause of part was important. And I thought about prior inventors like the Wright brothers and how they came up with the idea for flight by studying nature. Uh, da Vinci studied nature, studied the wings of birds, you know, that get lift and uh, realize how lift works and pressure works. And I said, well, if aliens must be coming here from planets that are hundreds and thousands and, and more light years away, and they're certainly not doing that with rockets. So they have to be using anti-gravity and they have to have a way to go move at speeds greater than the speed of light. And I did some simple calculations. It, it can't be just one or two, like Star Trek eight times. That's pathetically slow. That will not get the job done. If you want to go to Alpha Centauri or whatever, it'll take 4.2 light years one way. One way it will take 4.2 years to get there and 4.2. I figured, you know what? You got to not only break the light speed barrier, but you got to break it by 20 or 30,000 times or more. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and so I, I said, well, that field 
which, you know, a warp field, which is what Star Trek calls it. I, I wound up calling it slip wave because I said, you use nature as the example. The fastest moving thing we have is the photon. Figure out how it moves. That becomes what I call the slip wave, which is basically a pressure gradient because it's the photon is made of two twists. And physicists will argue with it, but their own data says the photon has a positive portion and a negative portion. So it's got a clockwise and a counterclockwise spin to it. And, and these create pressure gradients and it moves with velocity in a particular direction. And so something's going on inside of that particle that makes it move. That's the slip wave. So it's a pressure gradient. But more than that, slip wave version 2.0 now says so it's actually two gravitational fields. It's a gravitational field in the front, normal, what I call gravity two. It's non-contractive gravity and anti-gravity in the back. So it falls forward and it's pushed forward. And that is the slip wave. So when you make a spaceship and you want to move at the, beyond the speed of light, you have to use the same configuration of dipole, which means a plus and a minus north and pole and south pole. So there's really only two ways to, to make a slip wave, either with magnetism or with electrostatic fields, but high, high powered. I mean, really high powered. You, I tried doing the magnetic, forget it. It's a waste of time. You cannot generate enough current from your household current or whatever to do it. You have to have big time current, you know, like thousands and thousands of amps. And that tends to blow up whatever you're you're using. And my friends could not, they heat it up, but they could not even generate a fraction of a gram of anti-gravity. So anybody that tells you they got a magnetic system, they have, I would have to have a super powerful source of energy. And it's not likely that Guys like me are going to be able to do that. But the electrostatic method, the electrogravitic method is definitely the way to go. And, um, but the slip wave 2.0 is really the cause of motion as I've determined now. It's really gravitational. Uh, not so much the pressure wave as I thought before. Uh, that does exist and that is in there. There is a pressure gradient inside of particles, but the ultimate uh, cause of motion is that gravity contracts or pulls on one end and pushes on the other end. And so it falls toward the pull and away from the push. And, and that's how you, you make a slip wave, which is the way. Now, there's another key point here. Both those fields stretch phase. Even the, the gravity too, because it, it's a displacement of space all the way around the field. So it never contracts. It's just a space that was here is now here. Space that was now here is now here. And it goes all the way around the object. So that's stretching space. And when you do that, you drop two properties of space, permittivity and permeability. And, and what are those? Those have to do with the way the electrostatic field and magnetic field form in space. So space really has properties. So that's evidence that it's the real thing. Right. So if you go out into the middle of space way out there, it has permittivity and it's measurable. And if you create the slip wave field, which is an expansion of space all the way around, you decrease the density and you would decrease permittivity and permeability. And why is that important? Thank you, James Clerk Maxwell, because he said, see, the speed of light equals one over the square root of permittivity times permeability. If you drop those numbers and run that equation, the speed of light goes up. Rock solid evidence coming from the master of electromagnetism. We know that equation is right. And, and so what I'm telling you is right, if you drop it, and scientists have done that in materials called metamaterials. And when you find light in those materials, they're claiming it goes infinitely fast. They drop permittivity and permeability to zero. And if you run that equation 
with those numbers being at zero, it's infinitely fast. And so it's possible for us to build the spaceship that go any speed we want. We could be to another star system in 15 minutes or yeah. that's that's huge very practical that's doable yeah very dangerous there's things you got to be aware of you cannot lose the slip wave you cannot drop the field when you're in motion like that it is lethal to cut you, you need to slow down first then cut the field <laughs> that's very dangerous yes now you talk about a, a slip wave spatial bias drive. Is this your idea for you know superliminal travel? Um, yeah, that's the mechanism that is used uh, to create the slip wave field. It's basically now I've come to the conclusion you can call it an emitter, and uh, the emitter will emit on one end gravity, gravity two. It's a different type of gravity and anti gravity. And that is the slip wave spatial bias drive. It's very much like the Alcubierre drive. Yes, I was just thinking that. Yeah, very much like it. But his equations are wrong because he's using gravity one, and thinking that gravity one is the contraction, as I said, is the condensation of space, and so it's like. In his description, well, you have to bend space together and contract it. And if you did that, believe me, you would not break the light speed barrier. And if you did it too much, you would create a black hole. And that's that's not going to work. You need to use the other gravity that I've discovered in my lab during my experiments. You need to use that gravity. And you, you, you use an electromagnetic device. Uh, and best case is something that makes a lot of high voltage and it, the higher the better and the fan and um electrogravitic has got to be the way that the united states government is because it's you need way less power than the magnetic version interesting um would something like antimatter be something that fuels fuels that or you don't need that kind of energy Involved. I think that there's there is a um, many different ways to create the the kind of energy we need, and that's one of them. That's a little hard to manage, very hard to yeah. create um, uh, antimatter and then contain it, and then you know dispense it and right. have it crack. Uh, that would not be the way I choose. Uh, Bob Lazar talks about element 115, and I'm not sure about how it works, but there's a lot of current. There's like a cyclotron, the currents rapidly spinning around inside of it, and um, and somehow they can. This particular craft he worked on was able to project the energy without wires, which boggled the physicists that were working on it. And I don't think he ever figured that out. I think there's things they could have done to determine that. I, you know, I wish I was there to help out because I had, they immediately gave me ideas because, okay, yeah, the emitter is getting the power from things sitting in the middle and they're not connected. Okay, there's only so many ways to do that. And magic, cross that off the list, okay? Don't use that word, don't think it. It's not magic. There's some physical process. And, um, but they, they were clueless at the time. I don't even know if they've ever figured it out, but, uh, using matter, antimatter, you know, we got the idea mainly from Star Trek. I think there's a lot of zero point energy solutions out there. Um, unfortunately, these people get silenced as soon as they come out with something. Yes. Yes. It seems to be the, uh, the, the common thread among that kind of, uh, People who and there, look into that. There may be ways of making, and I've tried, but I have not succeeded yet, of making magnets move in a perpetual, what you need is perpetual motion. Somehow, you've got to build some mechanical device that moves on its own. And once you do that, 
then you just put mount the magnets on there and put coils near them and you get all the power you want. And the faster, the beauty of it is the faster those magnets move, the more the power. It's all got to do with motion of energy and and to create the force. Yeah. <laughs> and and forces are used to create the motion. So it's it's all interlinked. It's all sensible. And so yeah. Steve, uh, Stephen Greer is doing some work with people, but they're all, they all seem to get tied up with legalities. And I think the government, and I know, I know power companies have stopped people. They bought patents and held them and still hold them. Things that would change the world. Yes. And they used to release them. I know this for sure because I talked to somebody that worked for a company energy company and they told me they have patents that they they don't use wow wow that's very interesting mankind is mankind's most worst enemy yep yep we're doing this because of greed and, and power and all the the vices and all the weaknesses of humanity are working against the betterment of humanity you know, free power would be a great thing. Not only that, but being able to use the slipwave technology and have hovercrafts would make travel across the earth much easier. Traveling oh, yeah. to space, travel into space would cost pennies, pennies on the dollar, fractions of pennies on the dollar. <laughs> and and we may need to leave this planet if something really wrong happens. And right now we only a handful of people are going to be able to leave because the only people that have the technology is the air force. So. Right. Yeah. And uh, people who can afford the, the ticket off, off the right. Plane, right. <laughs> oh, well, I'm sure that uh, a bunch of my, my listeners uh, want to hear some more um, things on UFOs and like the conspiracy behind that. What's, what's your take on, on all of that? I know we touched on Bob Lazar very briefly, uh, what do you think about, um, are, are you familiar with the recent whistleblower, David Grush, who's come out saying that uh, we do have captured transmedium craft? Yeah, uh, but you know, there's other whistleblowers who've been saying that. Yeah. So that's really nothing new other than this guy being, you know, definitely worked for the government and saying it. That doesn't surprise me. Bob Lazar said it and I'm very sure Bob Lazar is telling the truth because I investigated that guy, the ultimate first whistleblower who gave technical details that for years didn't make sense to me until I got my theory up to the point where I said, wait a minute, that makes sense according to what he's saying. And um, I was able to verify his his history that he claimed he is a physicist, he was a physicist, he is a physicist. I uh, did work for Los Alamos. And so, yeah, the new whistleblower guy, yeah. Okay, great. So we have another person that's yeah. saying <laughs> what we really need is somebody like the president or the vice president or or, or the general, you know, somebody, the P Department of Defense coming out and say, making an official government announcement, admitting that we have these technologies, admitting that the uh, there are aliens. Unless that happens, 50, 60 percent of the people aren't going to believe it. And even then, there's going to be a group of skeptics. But that'll start the momentum toward, you know, 70, 80, 90 percent of the people realizing, oh, we're not alone. And we're not. It's mathematically ridiculous. To think that in the billions and billions and billions of stars and the trillions and trillions of planets, we're the only ones. And and obviously, you know, these things which I've seen in the sky and other millions of people I've seen, they're they're starships from other planets, and they figured out a way to get here. And the only way to do that is beyond light speed or interdimensional travel, which is a whole other subject. But right. Um, you know, that's that's it. That's my opinion that, that in my belief, and I actually take it to a level of knowledge at this point. I know for sure they're here. 
Yeah, uh, I, I accept the evidence that's out there. This whistleblower is just more evidence that, of course, they're they got a whole campaign. They're, they've got I don't know how many captured UFOs that they've reversed engineered, and they continue to do that. They may even be shooting some down now to get the technology, but which I think is morally a mistake, ethically a mistake, and risks having war against people who can really kick our butts. Yeah, it wouldn't go down the way it does in movies, I'm sure, <laughs> where we somehow no. come out on top. Yeah, no. <laughs> no, if the, if the aliens really wanted to get rid of us, all we have to do is get a 10-mile-wide asteroid, push it at the Earth, it hits at about 70, 80,000 miles per hour, cracks the mantle. And, We're done. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Throws the atmosphere off, giant tidal waves. It, you know, 6 billion people are gone within 24 hours, and the other 2 billion are not much long after. Uh, they could do it anytime they wanted to. And that's the fact that the, this proves that they're peaceful because they haven't done that. And they're tolerating all of this stuff that, that we're doing to them because we're we're kind of an, uh, an ignorant race. Yes. We're like, <laughs> the, 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 uh, what is it that's been described as the wild west of the universe? We're a very unstable group of people at this point. We have potential, but um, well, there's a lot of evil going on, and the evil is calling the shots and uh, making things worse. Yeah, it's uh, unfortunate, but hopefully, you know, enough good people get together for some positive change to prevail. Keep doing shows like this. I appreciate you guys doing these shows. It's getting the word out there. Oh, yeah. And people for the truth. And that's what you're about. That's what I'm about. Getting the truth out there so that people hopefully can figure out a way to take action. Maybe maybe someday they'll have protests and, then, <laughs> and you know, the truth. That would be great if we had a million man march or a million man woman march on Washington demanding that they come forward with the information about aliens and the extraterrestrials and their technology that would that would make a difference yes that would that would definitely be something for sure um speaking of travel there was uh one thing that you talk about in your book um and you mentioned interdimensional uh would stargate technology kind of fall along that uh interdimensional or uh more of like uh just kind of opening up a window into another point in in space. I suppose you know, it could be all the same. <laughs> Stargates are very interdimensional, interuniverse as well, and uh, that's that's a very efficient way to get from point A to point B. Um, how you you see what it does? What limited understanding that I have of that particular technology is. Uh, it, it um, opens a portal uh, from one dimension, a time dimension, or a physical dimension, whatever, or a location within this universe or another universe, just pretty much like they would show on, in the Stargate series, where you just walk through and then you're from your one moment on, on one side and the other moment on the other side. That's very efficient. If you can get to another planet doing that, that's really much safer and much more efficient <laughs> way yes. of doing things. It's pretty much instantaneous. I give details of how I think one would be built. And some of that guidance I actually got from mediums who told me about certain things that I didn't know existed. And when I, I was still writing the book, so I added the Stargate chapter and um went about determining if what I was told existed. And one of the things that I was told was existed was a thing called a uh, fractal lens. And I know quite know quite a bit about physics. I never heard of that. And doggone it, but that does exist. And I found it on ResearchGate, and it's a metamaterial. And metamaterials are a high importance in the field, in the world of UFOs. Their, their crafts seem to be made of them, the outer exterior. 
Uh, it has electrical, it has properties that are, you know, very helpful if you want to break the light speed barrier. But if you shine light, and there are articles on ResearchGate that talk about people who made these metal materials, drop permittivity and permeability to zero in the material, shine light through it, and it goes infinitely fast. Well, when I started my chapter in Stargates, I said, well, if you want to build a Stargate, one thing's for sure, something is going to have to move beyond the speed of light. Something is going to have to vibrate at extremely high frequencies, because you're going to tune space with that vibration. So in the framework, you're, you're, you're oscillating, you're shooting light at a specific frequency, goes into the, the metamaterial, the, the, what I called it before, the <laughs> fractal lens. It comes out of there at blazing speeds, <laughs> unimaginable, high, high frequency. And so you can tune space by using a specific frequency by tuning the amount of permittivity and permeability in space. And you can control um, the, the rate of the frequency of the vibration of the space. And if you use sound along with it at high frequency in the air, you got all this vibrating and you, you tune to another port, you open a portal uh, and, and you go in. They've done this theoretically using magnetism and using magnetic resonant fields like in Philadelphia experiment. I think that's how they got onto the Stargate technology. Interesting. They stumbled over it while they were vibrating the, they were turning the magnets on and off in the ship to generate the uh, field that would make them invisible. They opened a portal into another time and, and another dimension. And, and then Project Montauk, they may have done it again. But I think they've moved on from the magnetic version and they're using this light version, you pumping, you know, laser beams into the that's the way I would do it at, my, at this point. You open a portal, opening into another realm, and you just step across. Yeah, uh, that's what I <laughs> very a powerful application and very practical yeah and you think that um uh, certain uh i guess com compartmentalized parts of uh you know the the military or someone is has refined this technology since the experiment on the eldritch and it's um, much more yeah. practical likely at this point yeah um they're using it to travel through time as well and they also use remote viewers, uh, which is a very cost effective way. It's not as um, controllable, not as guaranteed, you know, 30, 40% success rate or whatever. But they can go and visit through consciousness, which is, you know, an ability we all have if we learn and we train ourselves as we expand our consciousness as, as we evolve. And it'll be more and more commonplace. And so you could go anywhere in the universe instantly just by thinking about it. But you kind of got to, your your consciousness has to go out of body, which I personally am not that comfortable with. But <laughs> I can do that and it doesn't bother them. But that's another way, you know, another Stargate type of technology that's available. So you got the physical one, the machinery, and then you've got the the advanced consciousness uh, techniques that also can do the same thing to a certain degree. Yeah, that's super interesting. Does does any of that um, tap into like spooky action at a distance or entanglement, um, that kind of thing? You know, I've, that that experiment has bothered me for many years, like it bothered Einstein. And I really think it's a misinterpretation of quantum mechanics. That's one explanation that explains the measurements. You know, the reason why quantum, quantum entanglement is so popular and everything is because the, the idea, which really came from Einstein, there is really spooky action at a distance going on. There's another explanation, though, that very rarely gets mentioned, and that is 
this. <laughs> when the two particles are created and they're split, they have all the um, properties and they're stored as they're traveling through space, their spin, their polarity, whatever. And, and when you measure one and then you check the other one, you know, it's assumed that when you measured this one, that one switched. But we don't know that for sure. What it could be is that uh, when you, you have a entangled photons and you have one that's polarity this way and the other one's polarity that way, it was already set. So there's no real spooky action at a distance. You do have you have successfully measured the pair. And just because you measured this one first and this one was the opposite polarity or, or yeah, uh, then then something happened to change that. And I don't think that's really what's happening. I think, like Einstein said, there's settings that are on both particles as they travel apart. And when you rerun, you know what the other one is if it's an entangled particle. But that's not spooky action. The reading of that one is not really affecting the other the other one at all. And uh, so that's still argued and debated about. And uh, I don't know if we'll ever get that resolved, but um, I don't think that's a practical way to get across. Plus, you still the separating at still only the speed of light. And yeah. so you can't really use it to get to another planet because you already have to be there or your other twin particle or whatever. So it's not really something that could be used practically for faxing people or transmitting. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Stay there or whatever. I mean, uh, they may eventually make a quantum computer, but it's really got to do with just uh, the, the quantum mechanics formulas predict the right answer because they're better probability equations than the classical ones used. And that was misinterpreted as meaning, well, quantum mechanics is right. Spooky action and distance must be the cause of the explanation because our equations work better than it. The difference is very small, the probability calculations, but the quantum mechanics ones are right because it uses wave theory from, um, oh, I can see his name, uh, the collapse of wave function coming from Einstein's friend. I can't remember his name. It'll pop up. But um, yeah, I, I'm not a real big fan of, I think the whole EPR experiment has really served to confuse humanity into thinking quantum mechanics is somehow magically right. But they don't have any experience. Uh, you know, it can't be that special relativity is being violated. They've said that time and time again. No, it's not. Well, how did it happen? You eventually box them into a corner where they have to use the word magic. Yeah, well, magic doesn't work here. This is physics and this is reality. And so there must be a mechanical explanation. And it's not the one where this one is magically tweaking the other one. Um, there's, I'm not buying it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, one one final thing uh, that I wanted to ask you about um, before we, we wrap up here, because we're uh, just after the top of the hour, <laughs> uh, is uh, the stellar converter. This is a phrase that I've, I've heard you being used in like science fiction and stuff like that. Um, can you explain what your thoughts on uh, the, st the stellar converter is and how it works? Well... As I was studying that, in fact, our universe is actually collapsing and not expanding, which is another thing astrophysicists have got wrong, I, I could see what was happening all over the universe. There's these collapsed, huge, gigantic collapsed stars that have millions of mass worth millions of suns inside them, big, giant black holes. The Great Attractor is one. And I saw, whoa, our galaxy, along with the whole galaxy cluster, is moving toward that. And it's accelerating. 
it's going faster and faster now. No need to work. No need to worry because that's billions of years away before we pass through to the event horizon and collide there with Andromeda and all the other galaxies in our group. But I thought, well, gee, I wonder if there's a solution for this. The only way to fix this problem is to undo a black hole. And that's where the stellar converter comes in. So what you use is the same technology you use to drive starships. You take that technology, you go to where the black hole is, you determine where it's, um, they're spinning, right? So it's got a North Pole and a South Pole. And then you, you drop these, uh, what I call magnetic rings, uh, concentric magnetic rings with high intensity magnetic fields. You drop them down until they actually come very close to the material substance of a black hole. And in my theory, black holes are made of neutronium. Why? Why did I come up with that? Well, because neutron stars are very close relatives of black holes. When a neutron star gets so heavy, all of a sudden it becomes a black hole. Well, that doesn't mean the neutrons and the material went away when it becomes a black hole. Was a lot of physicists believe. So what you have to do is touch the at the poles because they're stable there. You don't want to try to put this apparatus in another area other than the pole. Drop it down. The magnetic fields will undo the intense gravity field at the surface, and the neutrons will shoot up at you know beyond the speed of light until it exits the two uh, ring, the siphons that I call them at the top and the bottom. And what do you see way out there, deep, deep in outer space, there are things called quasars. And these are supposedly giant black holes that are shooting stuff out of their north and south poles. Right. You know, it's very unusual for a black hole to shoot stuff out at the speed of light. And they looked at the light and they saw that it was polarized, which means, for sure, there was high intensity magnetic fields there. Backing up what I just told you, it's the only me method or means to undo a black hole. Now, how did that magnetic field get there at the North and South Pole? There's only two ways that it could happen. Somebody put those devices in that I described, the stellar converters, which take the neutrons from the surface, bleed away the black hole until it's gone, and convert all those neutrons. Well, they go out into space and then they turn into something very useful after 15 minutes. Neutrons decay into hydrogen. Just what you need. Just what you need to make new stars. So that's the stellar conversion. The only other way that I could think of is that there's an accretion disk around these black holes with a huge amount of electrics, electrostatic, you know, electrons, ionized field. I mean, a huge amount. And so it makes a giant magnet that goes in and touches the poles and shoots it out. So there's a natural way to make one of these stellar converters. Or you could do my method, which you know, I'm sure would cost a lot of money and cost a lot of resources. I'm sure <laughs> uh, to to do. But if somebody eliminated the great attractor, which we're moving towards, at um, Earth is uh, the solar system is moving at 515 million miles per hour, but our galaxy is moving 1.3 million miles per hour toward the great attractor. So when we get there, it's game over, right? Yeah. So if we use this system, we fly ahead with this greater than light speed technology. We install the rings, the concentric rings of high magnetics or high electrostatics, if you want to use that, it might be easier. And you bleed the thing out till it's gone. So we'll get there eventually. There will be no black hole anymore <laughs> and we keep going like, like right through the area and we're saved but it doesn't matter really because in four and a half billion years or so the sun is going to overheat and uh it's going to expand and cook the earth anyway so <laughs> yeah right but that, 
my solution. That's that's how I said how to keep the universe from dying is you got to undo all the black holes, convert the neutronium neutrons back into hydrogen, spin them around neutron stars, because that's how stars are born. All stars have neutronium cores. Our sun has one. Another one of my predictions. Uh, and the sun definitely got a solid core, which NASA has has to admit because their own tech line measurements say it does. Yeah. So there should be solid in there and there shouldn't be at the temperature that is going on in there. There's something solid and that solid thing is causing fusion, which is driving the sun's energy, which creates the star. You need a fusion process. So that's why that's how I uh, decided to solve the, the dying universe theory other than letting it all collapse and then blow up again, which is what's probably going to happen anyway. Uh, right. Yeah. The, the cyclical nature of, of things in like the, the Kali Yuga. <laughs> well, this has been a super fascinating uh, conversation. So uh, thanks again for coming on to the show today, Mark. This has been great. Pleasure to have you. Can you tell my listeners where they can find you online? Where's the best place to uh, pick up a copy of your book? And um, yeah. Yes. Uh, if you guys have any of uh, your your viewers have any questions they wanted to get through, they didn't get a chance here today. Go to my website, www.super-relativity.com, super-relativity.com. And I have a, a page where you can sign up, make comments or whatever. I'll get the, an email from the website with your comments, your questions, and I'll send you an email back because you will give me your email. I'll also email you back with the answer to your questions. So you go there and I got links to my papers on ResearchGate. I got some videos you can watch. I got a blog that might answer some of your questions. Uh, it's all right there, pretty much on that front page that you can go and uh, keep abreast of what's going on in the world of super relativity. And I have a YouTube page as well, or a channel where I put videos like this on there. If you're in agreement, I'll, I'll, I'll have a copy and put it on that page as well. So that's it, www.super-relativity.com. Great. Thank you again, Mark, for coming on today. And we'll talk to you soon. All right. Thanks again to Mark for coming on to the show. It was a pleasure to have you. Mark's work is truly fascinating. And if proven correct, his findings could definitely change the world in big ways, no doubt. Hopefully, we'll hear more from him in the future and get an update on his work as he's running experiments, calculations, and working through new scientific formulas for all of his theories. I'm glad you had the time to hang out with me today, and I hope you enjoyed this episode. As always, I want to give a huge thank you to everyone out there who checks out the Strangeology podcast. Whoever downloads it, shares it with friends and family, it helps me out a ton when you do that, and I appreciate it so much. My show wouldn't be possible without the support of listeners like you. If you want to get in touch, you can head to my website, strangeology.com, and drop me a line on the contact page or just send me a message to info at strangeology.com. I always appreciate constructive feedback, kind words, and of course, your support. The same goes for any business inquiries out there, or if you're an author, researcher, experiencer, or someone representing one of the above and want to come on the show and have a chat, you can also email me at that same address as well. Also, make sure to give me a follow over on all my social media accounts. You can find me on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. I'm most active posting short form content on Instagram and TikTok. So if you're looking for more content from me, definitely check that out. I have a lot of fun with it. And there's a ton of content out there already. I also periodically host giveaways for my merch on Instagram. So if you're gonna follow one account, definitely go with that one. And as of releasing this episode, I should have a giveaway posted 
a day or two after this one drops. Also, if you're looking to continue the conversation on the strange and unexplained and want to join the community, I do have a Discord server and you can join that at discord.io forward slash strangeology. Try to have fun there, post some funny cryptid, paranormal, Fordian memes, and just chat about all the weird stuff out there in the world. And if you're looking for another way to support Strangeology beyond Patreon, my merch is available over on my Etsy shop at strangeology.etsy.com, where I have a whole assortment of cryptid, alien, and Fordian gear and accessories available on things like t-shirts, hoodies, tank tops, long sleeve t-shirts, sweatshirts. I've also got stickers, magnets, prints, mugs, blankets, enamel pins, and more. Again, that's strangeology.etsy.com. All right, I think that's all from me for now. I'm going to take a quick break here, and when I come back, Mark was able to hang out for a little while longer to chat more about his work, his different experiences with psychics in Casadega, Florida, along with other strange events in his life. You won't want to miss it. Patrons, stick with me, and for everyone else, until the next time, take care of yourselves and each other, and keep it strange. Welcome back, members, to Strange Elegy Beyond, your exclusive members-only part of the show. So thanks again, Mark, for joining me today.